So. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's event, Oil Gotten Gains, Petrodollars, Abscam, and Arab American Activism, 1973 to 1981, which is part of this year's Chastain Johnston Middle East Studies Lecture Series. Thank you all for coming, especially I wanna shout out to my students and to the Schaefer folks in, the, in attendance, as well as some of Salim's uh, own students who are joining us from all over the place. It's great to see some familiar faces. For those of you who don't know me, I am Kelly Shannon, Associate Professor of History and the Chastain Johnston Distinguished Professor, sorry, the Chastain Johnston Middle Eastern Studies Distinguished Professor of Peace Studies at Florida Atlantic University. I'd like to thank our co-sponsors for this event, FAU's Department of History, and the Peace, Justice, and Human Rights Initiative. I'd also like to thank the Dorothy F. Schmidt College of Arts and Letters, whose support makes programming like this possible. Our guest tonight is Dr. Salim Yacoub, who is Professor of History at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and Director of the Center for Cold War Studies and International History. He is the author of Containing Arab Nationalism, the Eisenhower Doctrine and the Middle East, published by the University of North Carolina Press in 2004, as well as of several articles and book chapters on the history of US foreign relations, the international politics of the Middle East and Arab American political activism. Professor Yacoub's second book, Imperfect Strangers, Americans, Arabs and US Middle East Relations in the 1970s was published by Cornell University Press in 2016. He is now writing a post-1945 history of the United States for Cambridge University Press. Today's event will feature Professor Yacoub's presentation followed by time for audience questions. To ensure that everyone in attendance can hear the speaker, please make sure to mute your microphone during the event unless we call on you to speak. Today's event will also be recorded and posted to the PJHR website where you can also find recordings of our previous events this fall on Afghanistan and on Iran. And I just dropped that website in the chat. In the chat. So without further ado, Professor Yacoub, thank you for coming and I'm going to pass the microphone to you. Okay, thank you so much, Kelly. It's a real honor to be here with you and your, your students and everybody else. Uh, this was initially supposed to be an in-person visit. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, that wasn't possible. So I'm sorry I'm not able to um, uh, be in the physical presence of Kelly and all of the other people at FAU. The silver lining, of course, is that there are many other people who can join us as well. So I'm happy about that part of this whole digital um, version of the event. Um, what I'm going to do now is switch over to um, screen sharing. And I will, um, I think I'll ask you, Kelly, to confirm for me that you can see everything clearly, and then I'll proceed further. So let me just uh, make sure I've got the right settings. And um, I, sh so I've now, I'm now displaying my, the beginning of my presentation full screen. Is that what you're seeing? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so my talk explores the abscam affair of 1978 to 1980, which in which several members of the US Congress were arrested for accepting what they believed to be bribes from wealthy Arab businessmen. The transactions were actually sting operations conducted by the FBI. Some of you may know about Abscam from watching the movie American Hustle, which came out several years ago. It's a very good film though it doesn't tell us much about the Abscam sting operations themselves. I'll be examining Abscam in relation to two separate historical trajectories, growing American anxiety about the circulation of Arab petrodollars within the United States. Uh, I am somehow not able to advance my screen. Let me okay. see. Okay, try clicking on the Zoom or sorry, try clicking on the um, the PowerPoint app that you have open and see, sometimes you have to switch between the apps. Okay, well, all right, so that, I think it's, all right. So I'll just, okay, uh, so uh, let me just back up a little bit. I'll be examining Abscam in relation to two separate historical trajectories, growing American anxiety about the circulation of Arab petrodollars 
within the United States in the rise of Arab American political activism. I should note that this talk is drawn from a book I wrote, um, which we just heard about, Imperfect Strangers, Americans, Arabs, and US Middle East Relations in the 1970s, which Cornell University Press published in 2016. This is a multidimensional study that looks not just at political and diplomatic relations, but at cultural, psychological, and demographic exchanges as well. It argues that the 70s were a pivotal decade in the evolution of the US-Arab relationship, a time when Americans and Arabs became an inescapable presence in each other's lives and perceptions, when members of each society came to feel profoundly vulnerable to the political, economic, cultural, and even physical encroachments of the other. These transformations, I argue, profoundly shaped the course of US-Arab relations in later decades and into the 21st century. But today I'm focusing on ABSCAM, which grew out of a more particular set of events during the 1970s, touching on the role that Arab oil money played in the economic, political, and cultural life of the United States. The sharp spike in the price of oil after 1973 provided petroleum producing countries with enormous revenues, petrodollars they were called, to invest in the global economy. By the second half of the decade, there were widespread fears in the United States that Arab governments, companies, and individuals were using their vast oil wealth to buy up America. The Abscam affair in which FBI agents posing as rich Arabs induced several members of Congress to take bribes reflected this anxiety about the potentially harmful influence of petrodollars. In the dominant American narrative, Abscam suggested that US democracy itself was vulnerable to foreign corruption. To many Americans of Arab descent, however, the affair demonstrated that anti-Arab prejudice had assumed alarming proportions and that concerted political action was necessary to combat it. This realization coincided with, and in some ways propelled, a transformation in Arab American political activism. Such activism was conspicuous throughout the 1970s, but earlier in the decade, it had focused mainly on foreign policy, especially the Arab-Israeli conflict and the Palestine issue. There had been less focus on demeaning or discriminatory treatment of Arabs and Arab Americans inside the United States. Abscam played a major role in placing those latter issues at the center of Arab American activism. Abscam also exemplifies a broader and rather ironic pattern. On the one hand, the increasing circulation of petrodollars was a cause of greater alienation and hostility between the United States and the Arab world. On the other hand, it spurred efforts to overcome that alienation and achieve mutual understanding. As I'm sure most of you know, in October 1973, Egypt and Syria launched major offenses against Israeli positions on the Sinai Peninsula and the Golan Heights, respectively. During the ensuing war, in response to a US arms airlift to Israel, several oil producing Arab states cut off oil shipments to the United States and some other Western nations. The embargo, which lasted until March 1974, caused panic buying, hoarding, and real and imagined gasoline shortages in much of the industrialized world. In the United States, motorists waited in long lines, sometimes stretching for blocks to buy gas. Once it became readily available again, gas was far more expensive than before. It cost 55 cents per gallon in the spring of 1974, as opposed to just 38 cents the previous summer. This may sound blessedly cheap, but bear in mind that the median household income at that time was about $11,000 per year. 
The price increase occurred because the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC, which consisted of several Arab states, along with non-Arab members like Iran, Venezuela, and Nigeria, had taken advantage of spiking demand by raising its price from $5 per bar barrel in October 1973 to nearly $12 per barrel in December of that year. Higher energy prices drove up the cost of everything else, sharply increasing the overall rate of inflation. Moreover, because energy is integral to virtually every aspect of a modern economy, the fact that it was scarce or extremely expensive crippled industries and businesses in many parts of the world, including the United States. This led to simultaneous increases in inflation on the one hand and levels of economic stagnation on the other. Ordinarily, these two problems exist in an inverse relation to each other. Economic policymakers can address inflation by slowing down the economy and thus risking stagnation, or they can address stagnation by heating up the economy and risking inflation. But now inflation and stagnation were combined in a new condition known as stagflation. How in the world do you deal with that? The oil crisis was by no means the only cause of stagflation, but it was a major contributor to it. Stagflation remained a serious drag on the global economy throughout the 1970s and into the early 1980s. As a consequence of all this, there was among Americans a strong feeling of vulnerability, impotence, and decline, a belief that their nation had seen its best days and would now have to cede the initiative to others. In parts of the Arab world, by contrast, there was, at least for a few years in the mid-1970s, a mood of optimism, confidence, and assertiveness. For reasons I discuss in my book, this feeling dissipated quite rapidly in the late 1970s. But in the middle years of the decade, there was a striking perception of rising and falling fortunes, a sense that Arab wealth, power, and strategic opportunity were on the upswing, while the status of the United States was inexorably declining. For several years after 1973, the spike in oil prices allowed Arab oil producing states to amass enormous revenues and much of that wealth circulated through the global economy in the form of investments, bank deposits and purchases of goods and services. The largest single destination of Arab capital was the United States, where in the second half of the 1970s, Arab governments and private actors invested tens of billions of dollars. <clears throat> Consequently, over that same period, there was a mood, there was enormous concern in the United States, sometimes bordering on hysteria over the extent to which the nation had become vulnerable to economic control by wealthy Arabs. This sentiment was especially evident in American mainstream and popular culture, news coverage, movies, television programs, and novels. Not only were the Arab states trying to use their oil wealth to force the United States to change its Middle East policy, the argument went, they were buying up American properties at an alarming rate, thereby gaining a stranglehold over the nation's cultural life. In novels and news stories featuring such encroachments, a common device was simply to list the various American locales prominent and obscure, in which wealthy Arabs had purchased major properties to show how thoroughly the tendrils of Arab economic power had crept into the nooks and crannies of American life. So, for example, the protagonist of Harold Robbins's 1974 novel, The Pirate, a rapacious Arab plutocrat named Bider El Fay, is described as having wound up as the controlling stockholder of a small bank in La Jolla, California, a mail order insurance company based in Richmond, Virginia, and a home loan and finance company with 40 branches in Florida. <clears throat> 
1974 article in the Wall Street Journal reported that Adnan Khashoggi, a Beirut-based Saudi Arabian who has purchased two California banks, also has acquired about $1 million in raw land for development in California. The Kuwait Investment Company this month bought Kiowa Island off Charleston, South Carolina. Wooten and Associates, a Dallas builder and developer, says it has about $200 million in Middle East financing for an apartment development in St. Louis. It's often forgotten that one of the most famous slogans to come out of 70s cinema, I am as mad as hell and I'm not gonna take this anymore, was itself closely associated to American sense of impotence and rage in the face of an economic onslaught from the Arab world. That line, of course, comes from the award-winning movie Network, released in 1976. As the title suggests, the movie is about an imaginary television network called UBS. One of the news anchors on UBS, a man named Howard Beale, suffers a mental breakdown and starts to make outrageous statements during his news broadcast. Now, instead of doing the humane thing and taking Beale off the air and getting him into treatment, the greedy managers of UBS decide to keep him on television because his wild rantings are good for UBS's ratings. Beale's popularity becomes especially evident in the movie's most famous scene in which Beale delivers a wild diatribe about the eroding quality of life in America, the rampant inflation, the exploding crime rate, the worsening pollution, the incompetence and corruption of political leaders, etc., and then exhorts his audience members to get up out of their chairs, go to their windows, stick their heads out and yell, I'm as mad as hell and I'm not gonna take this anymore. Across the country, hundreds of thousands of Americans follow Beale's instructions, demonstrating his power over the American public. The main, <clears throat> the main villains at UBS are a brash young producer played by Faye Dunaway and a company executive played by Robert Duvall. The Dunaway and Duvall characters conspire to keep Howard Beale on the air because his ratings are so high. In fact, they're so thrilled with Beale that they give him his own time slot, an Oprah-style talk show on which he delivers daily Jeremiads to a live television audience. On each show, Beale invades against the empty consumerism of American life, working himself into a wild frenzy. Each show ends with Beale getting so overwrought that he loses consciousness and collapses in a heap on the stage. And then the theme music comes on, bum, ba, dum, ba, you've been watching the Howard Beale show. It's a perfect arrangement for UBS. The show is extremely popular and it has an edgy and countercultural feel without really threatening any entrenched interests. Beale can decry the shallowness of American life all he wants, but as long as he refrains from attacking anyone or anything in particular, no one gets hurt. But then, oops, the unpredictable Beale turns his wrath on UBS itself, raising questions about CCA, the, uh, the, uh, the corporation that owns the network, and the extent to which CCA itself is being controlled by sinister outside forces. Beale launches his attack just as the Faye Dunaway character is speaking at a convention for UBS affiliates in Los Angeles, as we'll see in the following film excerpt. Okay, so uh, note what just happened here. Within the logic of the film, Beale is clearly insane, but it turns out he's right about the CCA deal. When it comes to the corrupting influence of petrodollars, not even a madman can exaggerate. Films like Network vastly overstated the extent of Arab investment in the United States. Although Arab governments and companies were buying up some properties in the United States, these transactions represented a tiny fraction of overall foreign investment in this country, 
less than 1% of the total. By far the biggest sources of foreign investment were countries like Britain, Canada, and the Netherlands. And yet somehow the specter of rampaging Dutchmen never inspired much fear in American hearts. Naturally, such cartoonish depictions of Arab economic power aroused keen resentment in some sectors of American society, especially among Arab American groups like the Association of Arab American University Graduates and the National Association of Arab Americans. These organizations did push back against negative portrayals, but not in a very systematic or sustained way. One individual who worked hard on this issue was Jack Shaheen, a young Lebanese American communications professor at Southern Illinois University at Edward, Edwardsville. In the second half of the 1970s, Shaheen began a one-man crusade against media stereotyping of Arabs. But because he was on his own, he didn't make much headway in getting media outlets to alter their content. The research Shaheen conducted in those years eventually appeared in his 1984 book, The TV Arab, with which some of you may be familiar. Uh, more recently, he came out with a uh, book and a, a documentary film called Real Bad Arabs, real spelled R-E-E-L, uh, looking at uh, negative portrayals of Arabs in uh, cinema. Uh, anyway, in the 70s, um, um, it really wasn't until the very end of the decade uh, that a more organized Arab American effort along these lines uh, would start to take shape. I'll get to that effort in a minute, but I first want to underscore the contradictory ways um, uh, that Arab petrodollars affected American society and US Arab relations. For the most part, the circulation of petrodollars and public portrayals of that phenomenon created greater anti-Arab sentiment within the United States, and thus greater antagonism between the United States and the Arab world. But there was also a positive dimension. In some instances, the availability of petrodollars helped Americans gain a more, a more favorable impression of the Arab world. And sometimes the anti-Arab sentiments resulting from the circulation of petrodollars inspired a counter narrative that placed the Arab world in a more favorable light. Higher education was a case in point. After 1973, oil rich Arab countries contributed tens of millions of dollars to fund Middle East studies centers at American universities. These donations aroused considerable controversy. Critics charged that Arab donors were corrupting the minds of American young people by sponsoring programs that burnished the image of unsavory Arab regimes or that encouraged unfair criticism of Israel. Some of you I'm sure are familiar with these sorts of controversies. In a handful of highly publicized cases in the 1970s, Universities were obliged by public pressure to rescind large gifts that they had already accepted and return the money to the donor governments. That said, most of the Middle East study centers were able to keep their donations and the programs uh, they created fostered greater understanding of the Arab world and the Middle East on the part of American students, faculty and researchers who participated in them. Such programs also, of course, uh, created more opportunities for Arab and Middle Eastern academics to visit the United States. There was another less direct way that the circulation of petrodollars fostered greater understanding of the Arab world within the United States by encouraging such a high degree of anti-Arab sentiment that Arab Americans finally pooled their energies and resources to combat it directly. This is where Abscam comes in. The story of Abscam begins in 1977, when a federal grand jury in Pittsburgh indicted a career swindler named Melvin Weinberg on mail fraud, wire fraud, and conspiracy charges. In American Hustle, Weinberg is the character played by Christian Bale. 
Weinberg made a deal with the prosecutors. In exchange for a reduced sentence, he would plead guilty and help federal authorities catch other offenders. So Weinberg and a team of FBI agents began conducting sting operations in cities up and down the Eastern seaboard. At first, their targets were ordinary financial criminals, not politicians. But Weinberg had a knack for fashioning scams out of current events, and the ongoing drama over OPEC and oil prices was irresistible. He began representing himself to potential sting targets as the agent of an imaginary Arab plutocrat named Kambir Abdul Rahman, Abdul as everyone called him, who was headed who headed an equally imaginary company called Abdul Enterprises. Abdul was interested in all manner of business, real estate, construction, entertainment ventures, financial speculation, and the purchasing of stolen artwork. All of the sting operations involving the fictitious Arab were grouped under the heading Abscam, short for Abdul Scam. Because so many of Weinberg's phony Arab projects required government licenses, favorable zoning decisions, and other kinds of official authorization, Abscam could not stay out of politics for long. Weinberg and the FBI soon found themselves in contact with Angelo Arichetti, the exuberantly corrupt mayor of Camden, New Jersey, who also served in the New Jersey State Senate. He's the one played by Jeremy Renner in the movie. Arichetti was delighted to learn that Abdul Enterprises was thinking of building a casino in Atlantic City and happy too with the bribes that accompanied this news. He promised to get the state to issue the necessary permits. It turned out moreover, that the mayor had acquaintances on Capitol Hill who would render services of their own for a share of Abdul's largesse. So in the second half of 1979 and into early 1980, Weinberg and an FBI agent named Anthony Amoroso met with several members of Congress, enlisting them in an array of schemes that amounted to government action in exchange for money. Occasionally, a second fake Arab, Abdul's associate, Yasser Habib, impersonated by another FBI agent, there he is in the picture, attended the meetings. Much of the promised government action involved bills in Congress to grant permanent residency to Abdul and Yasir, who supposedly feared being exiled by a revolution in their home country. Sometimes identified, sometimes those country, the countries was identified as the United Arab Emirates, and sometimes it was an unspecified Arab Gulf sheikdom. In return for pledging these favors, the congressmen came away with suitcases stuffed with cash or with promises of Arab investment in businesses they or their friends owned. Most of these encounters were secretly videotaped. In February 1980, in a cascade of leaks, scoops, and hasty official announcements, Abscam suddenly became public knowledge. One US Senator and seven House members were implicated in the affair. All but one representative would later be tried and convicted of bribery or related charges. In the mainstream media, Opinion was divided between those who were disgusted by the congressman's alleged greed and dishonesty and those who were alarmed by the FBI's use of entrapment. For Arab Americans, however, Abscam presented a different sort of outrage. They basically said to themselves, now, wait a minute, a scandal erupts in which no actual Arabs are involved and the net result is to make Arabs look bad? There's something wrong with this picture. Enter James Abarizic, a Lebanese American attorney and politician who had recently served in the US Senate representing the state of South Dakota. He teamed up with James Zogby, a young academic and activist to form the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee or ADC. The core members of ADC were veterans of existing Arab American organizations, 
uh, but the new group concentrated on discrimination and defamation. Following a planning meeting in Washington, D.C. in May 1980, and the opening of a national office in that city four months later, the ADC expanded rapidly. Activists across the country began forming local chapters, spurred on by Abarizic's offer to speak at inaugural banquets. In December 1980, Zogby could report that 17 chapters had been established or would soon open their doors. By the fall of 1981, the organization had 5,000 members. Over that same period, the national office issued a number of short, polished studies on media portrayals of Arabs. The first two studies on Abscam and children's entertainment were authored by Jack Shaheen. Working together, the chapters and the national office developed a formula for racking up small but heartening victories against anti-Arab defamation. Local activists would identify a conspicuous but correctable abuse in their area, such as a demeaning advertising billboard or storefront display, and complain the, to the offending party with letters and phone calls. The national office would follow up with objections of its own, sometimes supplementing them with complaints to the Better Business Bureau or if radio or television was involved, the Federal Communications Commission. On several occasions in 1980 to 81, in Colorado, Florida, Massachusetts, New York State, and elsewhere, the sponsors of the offensive portrayals agreed to discontinue them, sometimes with forthright contrition. They thought the depictions were harmless fun and had no idea anyone could be hurt by them. Not all of the exposed offenders were so gracious, however. The Preston Company of Lowell, Massachusetts, marketing a line of charcoal briquettes known as Sheiks, produced a print ad urging customers to save oil and other high cost fuels, burn Sheiks. And this is the image that accompanied the ad. ADC members from across the country protested to the Preston Company, whose lawyer responded with what the ADC called a highly insulting letter in which he made crude references to the sexual habits of Arabs. Soon thereafter, Preston announced it was pulling sheiks from the market. ADC declared victory, but the company's owner, John Preston, told the Los Angeles Times that the product was being withdrawn only temporarily and only because of labor problems at, at the manufacturing plant. He hoped to sell more sheiks in the future. Addressing the controversy in the Chicago Sun-Times, the columnist Roger Simon told his readers, some of you may find that ad mildly amusing, but there are a couple of million Arab Americans in this country who don't quite see the joke. It's hard to say which revealed more about the Arab American predicament, the Preston Company's murderous incitement or Simon's bland validation of the impulse to laugh the matter off. Into the early 1980s, the fear of Arab petrodollars subsided, largely because there was a temporary implosion of the international oil market, causing the price of petroleum from the Arab world to plummet and leaving Arab economic actors with less money to invest. But new perceived threats were emanating from the Middle East, especially revolutionary Iran and Muammar Gaddafi of Libya, who was briefly prominent at this time. So even though ADC and similar groups had some success in combating anti-Arab stereotypes, they found themselves facing a whole new set of cultural, political, and civil rights challenges. And this all too often threw them on the defensive. So I thank you very much for your attention and I very much look forward to uh, conducting the uh, uh, Q&A session with you. Great, thank you so much, Salim. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, there you go, um, not sharing your screen so we can see everybody. Uh, so the way that this will work is if you want to ask a question, you can either use the raise hand function in Zoom, 
Uh, or if you want to ask your question verbally, but you, you can't get that to work, you can type in the chat box that you have a question and then we'll call on you. Um, if you don't have a microphone or you don't wish to be unmuted, you can also just type your full question in the chat and we will get to you um, as soon as we can. So with that, uh, let's open this up for questions and you know, I'm sure there will be plenty about such an interesting presentation. Okay, there's a question coming in from uh, Doug McGetchen uh, in the chat box. Um, do Arabs consider anti-Semitism to include them? Who are the quote unquote Semites exactly? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, strictly speaking, Semites include Arabs. Uh, as a matter of convention, at least in the United States and you know, perhaps other parts of the Western world, um, it's uh, applied uh, exclusively to anti-Jewish bigotry. It's one of those situations like using America to describe the United States. I mean, uh, you know, there are people who don't like it, but it's a very uh, um, strongly ingrained uh, convention and you know, trying to combat it is probably you know, not worth your time. So, so you know, anti-Semitism for all practical purposes in ordinary discourse in this country means anti-Jewish bigotry. Um, I forget what the first part of the question was. The Arab, are Arabs concerned about anti-Semitism or what was the? Um, the first part of the question was, do they consider anti-Semitism to include them? Oh yeah, um, sometimes they do. I mean, there was, I mean, it, it, this kind of gets into the uh, uh, sort of an unfortunate uh, polemical, um, a pattern that you don't see so much anymore, but it used to be very common in you know 30 and 40 years ago, where uh, you know you'd have somebody um, making a presentation that was very critical of Israel, um, and then somebody would say, uh, you know, someone who was uh, supportive of Israel would say, oh, that's anti-Semitic, and then the the person's the first person would say, well, how can I be anti-Semitic? I'm an Arab and, and Arabs are Semites, Semites themselves. And, you know, so it's kind of, it sort of became a, a word game that didn't really advance the discussion. So I, I don't think you see so much of it anymore. You, for the most part, um, people of Arab background accept that anti-Semitism mainly refers to bigotry against Jews and they don't necessarily try to, you know, change the conversation by putting themselves in it. Okay, and uh, Doug says, thank you. He likes Shaheen's Real Bad Arabs. He thinks it's very good at interrogating and unpacking stereotypes. And I agree, it's a really good book. Um, okay, so do we have other questions from the audience, please? Okay, hey, John. see, John, yep. Hi, uh, Luddite that I am, I'm, I couldn't find the raise hand button anywhere, so I just decided to turn my camera on. Salim, it's great to see you. I, I really enjoyed uh, this talk. It was so fascinating, and and it just really, uh, really got me thinking about a lot of things. I, I like especially the way you, you weave together culture and politics, and it's so seamless in the way that you've done this, so it's, it's really uh, fascinating. Okay. Um, I wondered if you could speak a little bit more about the things that you were talking about right at the very end of your talk as, as sort of we go into this moment of uh, negative stereotypes about Arab Americans having more to do with fears of uh, radical Islam mm -hmm. or terrorism. And I was wondering, did you think or, or do you see more continuity between the stereotypes of the 70s that you're looking at here that are more around petrodollars mm -hmm. rather than terrorism? You know, is that is that sort of a continuity be, yeah. from there to the '80s into our time, or um, or is it sort of a fundamentally different moment? Well, I mean, I'll give you the Weasley answer um, that it's both. I mean, there are elements of, of continuity and, and and elements of discontinuity. I mean, the continuity is the focus on terrorism um, and extremism because you know those accusations were made in the 1970s. They tended to be. Um, focus more on the actions of Palestinian and other uh, groups that generally um, were secular and often you know, far to the left, 
like the popular front for the liberation of Palestine and, and so forth. Uh, what happens in the, in the, uh, at the very end of the 1970s with the Iranian revolution, which you know, occurs outside of the Arab world, but nonetheless, you know, in the next few years, very heavily influences the Arab world, is that the focus, at least in the United States, st it stays on terrorism and extremism, but it also incorporates anti-Muslim sentiment or you know Islamophobia. And so um, that's the that's the where the rupture occurs, where the fear is less, I mean there is, I mean into the 80s you do have fear of Palestinian radical groups because there are some uh, pretty um, uh, notorious terrorist acts that occur you know perpetrated by Palestinian groups. So that so that continues into the 80s, but you know, increasingly the focus is shifting to Islamist groups. Um, first Iran and its allies like Hezbollah. And then um, of course, as you get, you know, later into the 1990s, uh, uh, Osama bin Laden and Al Qaeda. So in that sense, it, you know, you've got elements of both continuity and, uh, and rupture. Um, and, you know, you, I think to understand the picture you fully, you have to incorporate both. Thanks. Sure. Hey, uh, other questions? Well, I'll ask one while we're waiting. Uh, so what ended up happening to the people who were caught up in the ABSCAM scandal, especially the, the members of, con of government who were caught with their hand in the bribe bucket? Uh, different things. I mean, uh, uh, some of them did go to jail. Uh, some of them, I think, um, uh, were convicted but had their uh, sentences overturned because of the, this whole uh, entrapment issue. Um, interesting, one figure who um, uh, was caught up in it but ended up not being charged was John Murtha, uh, who was a congressman from a uh, Pennsylvania, I think, who um, ended up, you know, having a very uh, long, you know, career that continued all the way until the, you know, the, uh, the 2000s. And he was um, a very strong critic of the Iraq war and, you know, was kind of big in the news uh, for that reason. And, and of course, to, to um, discredit him, his critics brought up the whole Abscam uh, uh, connection. Um, but most of the others were, I and mean, they either either went to jail or had their careers ended. So it didn't end well for them. <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay, how about anybody from the audience? Especially any Schaefer people in attendance. Okay, we've got a question in the chat from Tony, uh, who's one of my students. Mm -hmm. Outside of Abscam, were there any real examples of Arab businessmen actually bribing politicians? That is a really good question. And I'm sure the answer is yes, but I'm hard pressed to come up with any cases that were nationally prominent. Um, you know, for the most part, it was a hypothetical uh, danger that um, that people invoked. Now, in, there were certainly cases that were borderline, where somebody received lots of uh, donations from an Arab donor, and then you know took votes that people later said were a result of um, those donations. But it could, you know, it was it, it was murky enough, and the. And even if it was if it was true, it wouldn't have been illegal per se. Um, so there were definitely there are cases of um, you know, arguably a, a, a more um, general and diffuse kind of corruption that's not that doesn't rise to the legal standard of, of bribery, but um, is you know part of the kind of standard corruption that we see in in politics all the time when you know large donors. Um, give money to politicians, that, and then magically those politicians do what the donors want. So it's certainly that kind of thing happened. Uh, as for, but as for um, specific cases where people actually, you know, were charged and went to jail for actual bribery rather than um, 
uh, faked bribery as uh, occurred in the Abscam stings, I'm not aware of any. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions from the audience? We have a few minutes left. Yeah, I just had a quick question. Actually. Um, so first of all, thanks for the great presentation. And I always love how you weave in videos and um, pop culture references. Um, so I'm actually just wondering to what extent this awareness of Arabs in the Arab world, uh, this increasing awareness in the 1970s was a global phenomenon. So kind of ex extending beyond the United States. And mm -hmm. um, just asking this, especially since you note how like industries during this time period uh, we're, we're crippled um, really mm -hmm. around the world. So I'm just kind of wondering how this is, um, you know, beyond the examples that you give. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I guess, I mean, what's really phenomenal about this period is that um, the Arab world and especially oil rich Arab countries gain a global prominence that they hadn't previously, just because they, you know, had um, the possession of this uh, incredibly precious resource and had, at least for a brief period of time, seemed to have the ability to, um, you know, employ that as, as 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 leverage. And so, what you have is that you know, uh, I talked about this kind of phenomenon of rising and falling fortunes, where people in the United States feel that they're in the decline, and people in the Arab world uh, are feeling confident and as if they're on the upswing. I mean, that was kind of in the realm of perceptions, but. There was, you know, if you if you transport this uh, to a different realm and say so you compare the uh, condition or prospects of Arab countries, especially oil rich Arab countries with the conditions of third world countries, then you actually really do have a very stark dichotomy of, you know, the Arab countries are acquiring wealth, gaining revenue, doing doing well, and the these countries in the third world are in really serious shape because they uh, are no longer able to, uh, because the price of oil has, um, you know, sometimes in some cases tripled in, a, in the space of a few weeks and they just can't afford to, to purchase oil. And in this created this whole interesting political dynamic where, um, you know, Arab countries were aware of this and they realized they, that if they didn't do something about it, they'd have a serious image problem and they'd become the bad guys in the third world. And so you do have these, um, you know, aid programs, development programs where, uh, you know, Arab countries are, you know, trying to help out say sub-Saharan African countries or other third world countries that are having a real hard time dealing with this um, uh, economic crisis. Um, but it's, but it, I mean, the, the, the Long and short of it is that definitely the Arab world acquired a prominence in this period that um, you know it was really you know quite extensive and you know pretty much the whole world's attention was on the Arab world for this brief period because uh, it, people wanted to know you know what in the world are they going to do are they going to continue this embargo uh, is OPEC which is not confined to the Arab world that includes non-Arab actors, but you know, what is OPEC gonna do? Is it gonna keep its price up? Is it gonna raise the price? So there's, there's a real drama surrounding the Arab world and OPEC that definitely um, get, captures the attention of uh, people throughout the world. And of course you have similar, you, know, you have a kind of a, a replication of this you know, anxiety about the uh, circulation of Arab petrodollars in other parts of the world. I mean, certainly in Europe was a big thing because there are you know, lots of European countries and you know, the UK, uh, for example, where you saw similar kinds of um, uh, controversies over you know, how much uh, you know, money from the Arab world was circulating in the UK and you know, you know, what properties were being purchased. You know, similarly in, in Canada and other parts of and, and Western Europe. So it's, it definitely is a is a kind of a global phenomenon that um, you know I you know I my own research focuses on the United States and how it reacted to it. So I I don't have the same the kind of same granular knowledge of how it unfolded in each of these other countries. But it definitely is an important story throughout the world. Great, thank you. It was a great question, Maddie. 
Um, do we have other questions from the audience? Uh, Kelly, may I ask a question real quick? Yeah, Dustin, go yeah, ahead Dustin, and then we'll come, ahead, to Johan. come to Johan. All right, uh, I'm sorry, I, I can't see my screen at the moment. Uh, and this is a question really driven by the fact that I know we have a number of graduate students in the audience, Salim, and, and I, one of the things that I'm really impressed with in your work is your ability to merge kind of political and economic themes and then cultural themes and sort of look at the Thank feedback you. loop between those two areas. And so I wonder if you might talk a little bit about sort of your entry point, right? Your methodology. How do you begin to get a handle on these you know, very complex issues and interrelated issues to begin to, to tell a, a coherent narrative and, and coherent causal explanations is you have this kind of feedback loop, right? You have the you have petrodollars that turn into uh, you know, a, a cultural narrative in the United States. It makes it into major movies like, uh, like Network and then presumably has effects back on public policy again as it affects public opinion. How do you, how do you get a handle on all of that? Um, well, you're, you're about to uh, make me expose a dirty little secret, which is that I don't really understand economics that well. <laughs> So when I want to deal with those themes, my comfort zone is less in the nitty gritty of the actual sort of economic dynamics and more in how people perceive them, because that, that's something I can, I can understand more clearly. So I guess the, um, the way I approach these things is to think of them in terms of, you know, broad controversies or dramas that are captivating large numbers of people in a society. And, you know, of course, that does at some point require at least a rudimentary understanding of what the actual economics are. And so I do my best. But, you know, fundamentally, I'm interested, you know, less in the economics themselves and in how people respond to stress and to changes in their life circumstances and to perceived threats and you know how um, they articulate those anxieties into you know broad pu public discourse and political action so I don't know if I can really answer your question more fully than to say that that's just kind of my orientation and it it comes relatively easy to me to, to look at it that way, um, you know, just in terms of, you know, what the, you know, what the, you know, what the stereotypes types are, and then what those, in the, to what extent those stereotypes uh, actually reflect reality and um, and take it from there. Um, so yeah, I guess I mean maybe I would say that my entry point is to start on the level of perception and then to interrogate the extent to which perception matches reality and, uh, and then how conflicting perceptions bump up against each other. Great, thank you, Dustin, that was a great question. And I'll say that Salim's a, a bit uh, modest because I think in your book, you do a very good job of explaining the economic side of things. Although for me, I'm really interested in the cultural side. Um, okay, so we have another question from, uh, is it Johanna or Johan? Thank you. It's uh, Johanna Marie. Hi. But don't worry about that. Hi. Thank you so much, uh, Salim Yacoub. That was absolutely wonderful to listen to. I've read several of your chapters and articles, so it's very nice to finally hear you speak. Uh, you. And it's super interesting. Thank you so much. Um, and my question to you um, continues a bit along the lines of perception, as you've mentioned several times because in my research, I've been reading a lot of American and British uh, government documents, researching um, the American and British relationship with Saudi Arabia, uh, late 70s and early 80s. And one of the things that keeps um, coming to mind is, because we're in the middle of the Cold War and the Americans what, what, what are a superpower. Time, am I asking what time period are you looking at? Um, the late 70s. So okay. 77, 79 through okay. 83, 85. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we're in the middle of a Cold War. The American is one of the Americans are one of the superpowers. Um, the relationship between the Americans and Saudis is going a bit. Um, it's getting painful. Um, the Saudis are definitely not happy with Camp David. Um, and looking at the 
different government documents, it's as if the Americans um, either misread or completely disregard many of the Saudis' interests and what the Saudis are wanting from the relationship with the Americans. Yet at the same time, we see the arms transfers to Saudi Arabia, a lot of it to appease the Saudis so that they will continue to try to moderate the oil price, mm -hmm. it seems. Um, and yet at the same time, I'm often left with the idea, and I'm hoping you can either confirm or explain to me why I'm wrong, um, that a lot of the Americans' frustrations with the Saudis, which is also what you showed us in the movies and in the newspaper articles, that a lot of it, it seems to me to be based on the fact that the Americans are so keen on seeing themselves as the top dog, the superpower, the ones who can do it all. And therefore the fact that there's this country that comes in and does things that the Americans don't like or can't control, that that seems so far removed from what they believe is possible. And therefore they need to see themselves as on top. And therefore it's the Saudis that are either wrong or devious or, something like that. Does that make sense at all? Or, or Yeah, I mean, I guess, okay, so you're saying that there's this um, kind of Arab superiority that Americans adopt when they come into contact with the Saudis? Um, no, rather that the Americans, that, that in some ways the Arabs are, in, um, obviously not in a Cold War superpower perspective, mm -hmm. but in some, um, ways the Arabs are stronger than the Americans, but the Americans are not able to see or admit when the Arabs actually have them. Um, okay. And, and therefore the Americans have to find another explanation model for why, the, like for example, and this is in the mid seventies when uh, during the oil embargo, Kissinger calls the Saudis, um, sorry, Schlesinger calls the Saudis shits, mm -hmm. little shits and Kissinger replies, yeah, they're just adolescents. Um, and the fact that the reason they're so derogatory about the Arabs is because the Arabs aren't playing the game that the Americans want them to play. Does that sure. make sense okay. or am yeah. I? No, I, no, I understand that. And I, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying. And I've certainly seen that kind of um, uh, attitude coming from Kissinger and other um, US leaders at that time. You know, certainly in the mid 70s, very, they're very upset with what Saudi Arabia and other Arab countries are doing. They, you know, they can't quite believe that they're actually, you know, using their oil leverage against the United States. And you know, there's certainly a very a great deal of indignation over that. Um, I mean, I do think that the power dynamic changes as you get into the late 70s and especially the early 80s, where the, you know, Saudi Arabia and other Gulf Arab countries actually do lose a lot of geopolitical leverage against the United States. And there are a couple of reasons why that happens. One uh, is uh, a uh, development I touched on very briefly in my talk, which is that you, you have in the early 80s, a real like an implosion of the oil market where the, the price of Middle Eastern oil and Persian Gulf oil, you know, plummets. And so the, the revenue that uh, uh, Gulf Arab and other, you know, oil producing uh, states in that area can um, acquire is significantly reduced. And they, they can't, you know, throw their weight around uh, in the same way that they were attempting to do a few years earlier. And then it's also, you have a greater degree of um, military dependence on the United States with the outbreak of the Iran-Iraq war in 1980, because uh, suddenly um, you got a number, you know, Iraq, you know, is fighting Iran directly, but then a number of other Arab countries in the Gulf that are really terrified of Iran and, you know, and there are moments when it looks as if Iran might actually overrun Iraq. I mean, the, the war goes back and forth, but there are moments when when there's genuine fear in the uh, among the Arab countries of the Gulf, and they are uh, relying on the United States. You know, it's at that time, 1980, 81, that the United States sells AWACS planes to Saudi Arabia, right? And this is a major kind of strategic. Uh, move that cements the relationship, but also, you know, shows the Saudis that they're kind of in a subordinate position and 
need to be a little bit, you know, they can't, by this time, it's just out of the question that Saudi Arabia is going to threaten an oil embargo against the United States. They just, you know, they need the United States far too much for that kind of um, activity to be possible. So I, I do think, I mean, obviously there's ebbs and flows in the price of oil and, you know, the Iran-Iraq war eventually ends. And, but nonetheless, I think, um, the, the Arab states of the Gulf never again recapture that moment of uh, leverage and psychological in, um, momentum that they had in the mid 70s. And so I, I do actually think that, um, you know, the, the Americans could, could get away with uh, treating the Saudis in that way, because uh, what were the Saudis going to do? Thank you so very much. Sure. Great. Thank you, Johanna Marie. Um, so we have a question in the chat from Doug. And Doug, if I misinterpret your question, feel free to jump in. But um, Doug wrote, what was the response from the Saudis or other Gulf states about the ABSCAM operation? Did they deny it? Did it give them ideas? And he said here he's thinking about the Bush family connections to the Saudis, for example. Um, also, was there any connection between ABSCAM and the Iranian Revolution in 1979? Because most Americans did not know the difference between Iranians wow. and Arabs or between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Okay, that, that's a great question. Um, well, two, two, two really great questions. And I'll take the second one first because it kind of chronologically precedes the, the second question. Um, you see the impact of the Iranian Revolution um, on the manner in which the FBI conducted the ABSCAM sting. Um, because what they, they create this, and they did it, it's actually quite brilliant. They create this whole scenario where, okay, there, here's this imaginary Arab leader who hardly ever shows up himself. I mean, he, 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 they trot him out a couple of occasions, but mostly he's, he's you know, off you know, in the wings. And it's these you know, Americans who are his... Um, representatives, and they're of course FBI agents who are pretending to be agents of this uh, fictitious Arab. But what they're, they're, they're describing his predicament, which is, okay, he's, he's either from the United Arab Emirates or from some you know, made up country, you know, the people that they're trying to scam don't know any better. Um, but he's deathly afraid that in this revolutionary moment where the, you know, the Iranian revolution has just occurred, there's all this you know, ferment throughout the region there's this genuine fear that a number of other um, conservative monarchies in that region are going to be overthrown. And so in that atmosphere, this guy, Abdul, he, he wants to get out of his country. He wants to get his money out of his country and lodge it, you know, uh, get it safely banked in the United States. He himself wants, you know, a permanent residency in the United States, you know, for himself and his family so that he can escape this revolution that's going to sweep over his country. So that that's the scenario that the FBI agents spin, and you know, in the against the backdrop of the Iranian Revolution, um, this is very persuasive, at least to these guys who don't know that much about the Middle East. So that that there's that's one way in which the Iranian Revolution plays into this. I'm sure, in the broader sense that you also suggested, which is that you know, to ordinary Americans, eh, they're all the same. You know, these. Uh, Iranians, Arabs, Muslims, what have you. It's all, it's just this kind of generalized, you know, other. And yeah, the, you don't, uh, and, and the fact that there's, you know, threatening behavior coming out of one Middle Eastern country makes it plausible that other Middle Easterners who have nothing to do with that country are themselves threatening. So in that sense, you're right. It, it kind of all feeds in together. Now, the other question, oh, the, the, then the other question is how the Saudis reacted and they were to, to the uh, uh, ab scam um, uh, sting you know once it was made public that the FBI had impersonated these Arab uh, figures uh, so the Saudis and not just the Saudis but you know Arab countries throughout that region especially on the you know Gulf Arab countries that were similar to the kinds of figures that were being impersonated um, were very indignant and um, demanded an apology and saying, you know, this is a defamation of the whole Arab world. It wasn't just the Saudis, you know, the Arab League issues this, you know, very 
uh, angry statement, uh, you know, demanding an apology from the United States and the Justice Department and so forth. And the Carter administration, because this was, you know, during the Carter years, it does issue kind of sort of a, a weaselly, you know, apology, not apology, saying, well, you know, we we certainly, you know, did not intend to uh, defame anybody in the Arab world and without actually saying, yeah, we did it and we're sorry. And so it, it kind of were able to uh, tamp things down a little bit. But yeah, definitely, you know, um, uh, feathers were ruffled and it, it was a diplomatic problem for, you know, some weeks or maybe months. Great. Um, anybody else have a question? We have time for about one more. Is there a question about emotional appeals or is that a... Oh, yeah, sorry. So uh, Doug responded. I think it's his response to your answer. Oh, uh, emotional yeah. appeals can be persuasive. Sounds like a Nigerian <laughs> banking phishing scam. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Peace yeah. be upon you. <laughs> um, yeah. I, yeah, there are a lot of other echoes, I think, that we could draw from the story that you tell to the present. Um, okay, any other questions? All right, um, I'm gonna ask one last one then. <laughs> um, so it, in your discussion of the really offensive Arab stereotypes that were popping up in American popular culture and um, some companies saying, oh, we didn't realize anybody would be offended by these. Um, they're clearly not thinking of American as including people of Arab descent. Um, and as you know, people who do these kinds of studies with when they bring in American culture about foreign relations and, and American uh, characterizations of, of other people. Um, it actually tells us a lot more about Americans than it does about the people they were talking about. So what do you think these American um, depictions of Arabs were saying about who Americans were in the 1970s? And do you think any of those characteristics in the 1970s have, have stayed on and are still part of the American national identity? Hmm. That's a really interesting and I guess in some ways difficult question. I mean, I guess the, you know, the, I, I sort of have to say or have to think that there are some, you know, enduring features of the American culture that uh, are still around. I mean, we definitely are in a much more um, kind of culturally sensitive frame of mind. I mean, sometimes it goes way too far with all the, you know, this obsession over uh, appropriation and stuff like that. But I mean, I think it's it, a lot of the things that were, you know, routinely shown on American television or uh, that showed up in advertising and other uh, media in the 1970s, you know, would, would simply would not be possible today. You know, partly because there's a, um, there's, just a there's just a larger percentage of the population that, you know, comes from that part of the world. And they've, you know, because of the experiences of the 1970s, you know, because groups like ADC actually came into being in 1980 and, you know, remain very active today, you know, there's, there's much more vigilance and, you know, media companies that engage in this kind of uh, stuff can expect to hear from um, people if they do this kind of thing. So I, I think in that sense, you know, whether it means there's there's a fundamental change in attitude um, or whether it's just that they, you know, realize that there's a, they'll get pushback and so they can't get away with indulging, you know, their um, sort of bigoted impulses is, is really hard to say. I mean, I, I do, I mean, I, I tend to be somewhat more optimistic in the sense that I think there has been genuine cultural change and people recognize that, um, uh, you know, first they recognize that there's certain ways of portraying other cultures that are offensive and should not be indulged in. And they recognize that many uh, people who descend from those cultures now live in the United States and that, you know, it's, and that, uh, you're not just um, targeting some exotic reality, you're actually hitting people in the United States. Um, so I think, I mean, I think there has been genuine positive cultural change in, in that respect. Um, and, you know, groups like ADC can take some small amount of credit for it. 
Great. Thank you. Yeah. I also see kind of a grievance against loss of status or a victim mentality coming from American reactions against Arabs who were, as you pointed out, were a very tiny percentage of foreign people investing in the U.S. properties. Um, that's kind of Americans would be completely fine with Americans going abroad and buying up property and doing the same thing. But when the tables are turned, there's a there's sure. a real defensiveness. Yeah. And I'm, I'm pointing it out because my, my grad students this semester are looking at the topic of American empire. And so mm -hmm. um, it's interesting for them to think about the 70s as this moment when things start to shift in terms mm -hmm. of American power. And there's this, I think I see some of the same kinds mm -hmm. of um, pushback today against, for instance, Chinese mm -hmm. investment sure. in the United yeah. States, so. Yeah, right, in the, in, in the 80s, uh, also, I mean, a lot of the same kind of uh, stuff was being said about uh, Japanese and you know Japan's buying up of uh, so it's, uh, of American properties, and you know you, it's always some you know very iconic American place like a Rockefeller Center, you know, and then you know the the, the caricature is oh they're going to buy what, what what's next the Statue of Liberty, you know, so it's always they always focus on some uh, symbol that is really quintessentially American and the idea that some foreigner has a piece of it is, you know, is anathema. But yeah, so I think, I mean, and of course, it's, yeah, people who had no problem with the United States going abroad and uh, just have, you know, participating economically in, you know, every conceivable way and, you know, doing also uh, sending military forces and uh, intervening and so forth, you know, people who have no problem with that, you know, suddenly find that when foreigners are doing something, even a very, you know, very, very mild version of that in the United States, they can't handle it. So, but I guess that's, you know, that's just the way people are. They, they, they see no fault in, or no threat um, coming from themselves, but project terrible danger when it is, coming from somebody else. Yeah, absolutely. And um, John chimed in in the chat. Yes, that's why your buy Toyota billboard picturing picture was so interesting and ironic. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, right. That's just, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, it's a, there's a Japanese company right there. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, well, th this was wonderful. Um, thank you, Salim, for your engaging presentation. I also really appreciated the pun in your title. Um, and I'm sure everyone in the audience learned a lot. Um, so thank you also to everyone who attended today. If you're interested in learning more about the Middle East, uh, the Chastain Johnston Middle Eastern Studies Lecture Series has events throughout this academic year. The next event will be an in-person event on April 19th in the FAU University Theater. It will feature Manaz Afkhami, the Iranian Minister for Women's Affairs before the 1979 revolution and subsequently an influential international women's human rights activist. She will speak about her forthcoming memoir and also how to do human rights work based on her decades of experience. Um, so keep an eye out for information on that uh, coming from lots of FAU channels, including the PJHR website in the new year. Uh, you can contact me for information. And uh, I would say if you're interested in learning more about what you just heard today, you should definitely get Professor Yakub's book, Imperfect Strangers, which is really fantastic and adds a really unique perspective to the scholarship on U.S. Middle East relations. Thank you. Thank, well, thank you. you so much. Uh, it was great to spend time uh, with you and with uh, everybody in this, uh, in this Zoom conversation. I really great. appreciate the great questions. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, so... Um, for the students in my graduate course, please stay on the line. Um, for everybody else, we are going to say good evening, and I hope that you have a great night. Bye.